in this episode. Music played an essential part in ancient Greek culture, from religious rituals and theatrical tragedies to everyday work and leisure. It was celebrated in the myths of the gods and its finest practitioners won fame and fortune. Welcome to Music History Podcast by Viola Studio Channel. Myth and Tragedy In Greek mythology, the lyre player Orpheus was identified as the father of songs. It was said that no living thing could resist the spell of his music, which could tame wild animals and even move stones. The lyre was also the chosen instrument of the god of music, Apollo, who was, in addition, the god of healing, poetry, and the sun. In a famous myth, the satyr Marcius challenged Apollo to a music competition, pitting his own aulos, a twin-piped wind instrument, against the god's lyre. The lyre triumphed over the aulos, the god over the satyr, and Marcius paid for his presumption by being skinned alive. Lyre or aulos? Such myths represented fundamental Greek attitudes to their musical tradition. The lyre was regarded as the quintessential Greek instrument, at least by the elite. It existed in several forms, from the simple, two-stringed lyre through the four minx with up to seven strings, to the sophisticated seven-string cathara, which was strummed with a plectrum. The aulos, in contrast, was denounced by Athenian intellectuals as an Asiatic, rustic instrument suitable only for use by the lower orders. They took the same dismissive attitude toward the syrinx, or panpipes. However, in the martial city-state of Sparta, Athens' great rival, the aulos was the favored instrument. The elevating songs written in honor of Apollo, known as paeans, were inevitably accompanied by the lyre. The spirit of Apollo, serene and orderly, came to be contrasted with that of Dionysus, the god of drunkenness and wild ecstasy. Dionysus was celebrated with hymns known as dithyrams, designed to excite strong emotion. These were typically sung by a chorus accompanied by the aulos. Sung Verse Music was seen as an important part of an elite education, and members of the ruling class in Athens were expected to play the lyre and sing. In singing may lie the origin of tragedy itself, the word tragoidia translates as goat song, tragos means goat, while ode is song. Scholars have yet to find a satisfying explanation for the goat, although a link with satyr plays, tragic comedies in which the goat-like companions of the gods Pan and Dionysus feature, is plausible. The founding of Greek lyric poetry, verses written to be sung while playing the lyre, is traditionally attributed to Terpander, who lived on the island of Lesbos in the 7th century BCE. Other lyric poets who attained fame included Alcaeus and Sappho from Lesbos, Alcman of Sparta, and Pindar of Thebes. Only the words of their musical creations have survived. Although written music existed, most musicians played or sang melodies learned by ear, and performances involved a large element of improvisation. Music and Drama Competitions Festivals involving music and drama competitions were an important part of ancient Greek life. The annual Kanya festival in Sparta included a music competition, while the Great Dionysia festival in Athens involved the performance of dithyrams, comedies, tragedies, and satyr plays. Held annually at the sacred precinct of Dionysus at the foot of the Acropolis, the festival was a competition judged by a panel of ordinary citizens. It was funded by the Korigoi, wealthy Athenian citizens who bore the major costs incurred by the extensive training and preparation of the choruses, musicians, costumes, props, and scenery. 
In addition to writing the words, a playwright was responsible for creating the music, choreographing the dances, and directing the chorus for each performance. A group of robed and masked singers and dancers, the chorus occasionally took an active role in the drama, reacting to events on stage and contributing their own brand of worldly generalizing wisdom. Their music was first and foremost vocal, with melody following closely the stress and rhythms of their lyrics, helping audience members in the farthest rows to hear the words. The only instrumental accompaniment was traditionally provided by a single aulos. It is notoriously difficult to reconstruct the music and dance in Greek tragedy, although this has not stopped scholars through the ages from attempting it. During the Renaissance period, classical scholars imagined that all the acting parts would have been sung, today, however, there is some consensus that the actors spoke their lines while the chorus interjected in song. Reimagining the movements and sounds made by the actors and chorus mostly relies on archaeological remains, images found on Greek pottery, and the references to dancing and singing in the surviving dramas of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. professional musicians. Originally tied to religious and civic festivities, ancient Greek music competitions took on a life of their own with the rise of professional musicians seeking to make their fortune from prize money. Competitions were held at various locations, with contests in choral singing, dancing, and playing the kithara and the aulos. Increasingly, Music became a form of elaborate virtuoso display put on for admiring audiences. Roofed concert halls, such as the Odeon in Athens, were built to supplement open-air amphitheaters. Tradition-worshipping intellectuals, notably the philosopher Plato, deplored the professionalization of music-making and the cult of virtuosi. Plato described these crowd pleasers as guilty of promiscuous cleverness and a spirit of law-breaking, because of their musical innovations. But surviving Greek inscriptions attest to the fame of the leading performers. Not only the top stars made a living from music, however. Everywhere in Greek society musicians were in demand, to provide solemn melodies for processions and religious rituals, entertainment at weddings, festivals, and banquets, or the dirges and lamentations for funeral rites. In the working world, rhythmic music encouraged laborers in the fields and kept oarsmen pulling in unison. Ancient Sounds Considerable efforts have been made in modern times to establish what ancient Greek music may have sounded like. The survival of a small amount of written music and of theoretical writings, as well as evidence of the nature of musical instruments, provide at least a basis for educated speculation on this subject. Most music appears to have consisted of a single melodic line based on musical scales known as modes. These modes, which bear no direct relation to the scales known as modes in modern Western music, were deemed to have different moral and emotional qualities. For example, the Phrygian mode, named after the ancient kingdom of Phrygia in Anatolia, in modern-day Turkey, was sensual, while the Dorian mode, named after the Dorian Greeks, was harsh. They included smaller tonal divisions than the semitones familiar in the modern Western tradition like quarter tones and even smaller intervals, which would probably have created a sound alien to our ears. After Greece will be absorbed into the Roman world from the 2nd century BCE and its musical tradition became part of ancient Roman culture. The most direct continuation of ancient Greek music into modern times lies will be in the music of the Eastern Orthodox Church, which developed in the Greek-speaking Byzantine Empire from the 4th century CE. Thank you for listening to Music History Podcast by Viola Studio Channel. Please leave us your comments and opinions.